Welcome to your Chapter 8 video lecture series where we're going to discuss Section 8.11 on bones of the lower limb. In our lower limb, we are going to have the areas of the thigh, leg, and the foot. And in our lower limb, we can find one femur, one patella, one tibia, one fibula, seven tarsal bones, five metatarsal bones, and 14 phalanges. So let's start off with the femur. This is gonna be our longest and heaviest and strongest bone in our body. We see that we have a spherical head that's gonna articulate with the acetabulum in our os coxa. And on the spherical head, we see a little depression on it that is going to be there for a small ligament called the round ligament that will attach the head to the acetabulum. Then we see an elongated neck over here that's gonna join the shaft of the femur at an angle. Due to this angle, we are gonna have a medially, medial angling of our femur. We also have on this proximal end the greater trochanter that projects laterally from the junction of the neck and the shaft. And we have our lesser trochanter, which we see a little bit better posteriorly here and medially. And both of our trochanters are insertion sites for our gluteal and thigh muscles, which we'll get into in our muscular system unit. And in this posterior view, we can see this intertrochanteric crest. It's just a thick oblique ridge of bone that connects the two trochanters. Anteriorly, we're going to see that there's an intertrochanteric line that travels between the two trochanters. We're also going to have this special line here called a pectineal line. This marks an attachment of a pectineous muscle that is going to serve as a lateral rotator of the hip. And our gluteal tuberosity that we find right in here in our posterior view is gonna mark an attachment of our gluteus maximus muscle, one of the strongest muscles in our body. And posteriorly, we can see this really prominent rough line. And that's what linea aspera means. Linea is line, aspera means rough. And this is just an elevated midline ridge where we're gonna see a lot of our thigh muscles attach, six of them to be um, specific. And we're also gonna see as we continue down that it's gonna branch into a medial and lateral supracondylar line. We'll also see on this distal end a popliteal surface, which is a triangular area that is bordered by these ridges. And then on our medial epicondyle region, we're gonna have this extra bump here, and that is called your adductor tubercle. This is gonna serve as an attachment site for our adductor magnus muscle, specifically the extensor part. Now, when we look at this distal end, we could see these knob-like structures here, and these are our medial condyles and lateral condyles, and they're just an oval articulating surface on this inferior femur surface and they're separated by a deep intercondylar fossa, which we see posteriorly. Our medial and lateral epicondyles, similar to our humerus, are just superior to each condyle, and anteriorly, we can see our patellar surface. This is just a smooth depression on this anterior surface where our patella is gonna articulate with the femur. Let's talk about the patella. This is known as our kneecap. It is a large triangular sesamoid bone. Remember, sesamoid bone means that we are going to encase this bone in tendon. For our patella, it happens to be the quadriceps femoris muscle tendon. This allows the tendon to glide more smoothly and it protects our knee joint. We can see that the superior border here is the base because it's more broad, and then the inferior region that's more pointed is the apex. We also have on this posterior view an articular surface where it's gonna articulate with that patellar surface of the femur. Now let's move into our leg. We have two parallel bones here. They are going to be thick and strong as far as the tibia, and the um, tibia is the one that is weight-bearing, whereas our fibula is not. And our fibula is very slender, and we can find this more laterally within the leg. 
These two bones are interconnected with an interosseous membrane, just as we saw with the ulna and radius in the forearm. And so we're also going to have these interosseous borders facing each other where that membrane will attach. This will help to stabilize relative positions of the tibia and fibula and will provide pivot of minimal rotation for these bones. Our tibia is going to be um, similar to the femur in that it has condyles, but notice how these condyles are found proximal. So here's our medial condyle and lateral condyle. They're pretty flat in here because we're going to have the condyles of the femur articulating here. Um, and in between here, we're going to have our menisci that we talked about in the knee joint. In between these condyles, we have an intercondylar eminence here that is a prominent ridge. And posteriorly, we can see this fibular articular surface. And this is where our fibula is going to articulate with the tibia to create a superior tibiofibular joint. And you could see that articulated over here. Anteriorly, we can see a tibial tuberosity. This is just going to be a roughened area, roughened bumpy area, and will serve as an attachment site for the patellar ligament. We also have an anterior border here that is most well known as the shin. And this is a ridge that's going to extend along the shaft and distally down the anterior tibial surface. Once we reach this distal end of the tibia, we see the medial malleolus. That is a large process on that medial distal border, and it could be palpated on the medial side of our ankle. Now for our um, fibular notch. The best view I could find is this one over here, where you have a little divot in this region. And this is going to be where the fibula will articulate in order to form the inferior tibiofibular joint. And if we look at the inferior surface here of the tibia, this is where we'll find the inferior articular surface where we are going to articulate with the talus, which is a tarsal bone. Now for our fibula. We said that we find this laterally and it is a long slender bone and it is non-weight bearing. Some people are actually even born without this bone. It has a knob-like head. It could be found inferior and posterior to the tibia's lateral condyle. We see that we have a constricted region over here, which would be the neck of our fibula, and then the shaft continues down as we head to the distal end of the fibula. Here we're gonna find the lateral malleolus, and we can palpate this on the lateral side of our ankle, and this provides lateral stability. For our tarsals, we have seven bones of our ankle, and they are found proximal to the foot. Notice how it's similar to our carpal bones, but our carpal bones have eight of them. The legend is that the calcaneus used to be two separate bones and it fused and became one. So in our proximal row of our tarsal bones, we have the talus, calcaneus, and our navicular bone. Our talus is going to be our superior most, uh, tarsal bone, and it is the second largest bone that articulates with the tibia at that inferior articular facet. And then we have the calcaneus, that is our largest bone, tarsal bone that is, that's going to form the heel. And this we can find posteriorly with a projection for attachment of our calcaneal tendon, or you may know this as the Achilles tendon. And our navicular bone we find on the medial side of our ankle. Now for our distal row, that's going to include our cuboid bone and our three cuneiform bones. These cuneiform bones are named because cuneiform means wedge-shaped. So we have our medial cuneiform, intermediate cuneiform, and lateral cuneiform. And they are positioned anterior to the navicular bone. Our cuboid bone can be found laterally, and it was named because it looks like a cube. And this is going to articulate with this lateral cuneiform medially and the calcaneal bone posteriorly. 
Now for our metatarsals over here. This helps to form our arched sole of our foot. And just like in the hand, we are going to identify these as Newman, uh, Roman numerals 1 through 5, medially to laterally. They're going to articulate proximally with the cuneiform bones or the cuboid bone. And they're going to articulate with our proximal phalanges as we move distally. We have two tiny sesamoid bones at the end of the first metatarsal, and you could see this in an inferior view over here. They're going to insert on the tendons of a flexor hallucis brevis muscle. Flexor meaning this muscle is going to flex, hallucis referring to the big toe, and brevis just means that it is a shorter muscle, and there's also a flexor hallucis longus. This will help the tendons move more freely. And onto our phalanges, we have a total of 14 of these, and our great toe is referred to as the hallux, where we're only going to see a proximal and a distal phalanx or phalanges. Our other toes are going to have three, whoop, three phalanges: our proximal row, our middle row, and our distal row. Now for the arches of the foot. Our foot is arched in order to help support the weight of our body, and it ensures that our blood vessels on the sole of our foot are not pinched when we stand. The shape is also going to be maintained primarily by the foot bones themselves, and our bones are shaped so that they can support their weight in this arch. We have really strong ligaments in here and tendons that are also helping to maintain the arch's shapes. So here you could see we have a medial longitudinal arch. This is going to be the highest of the three arches and will extend from the heel to the great toe. It's formed by our calcaneus, the talus, navicular, cuneiform bones, and our metatarsals one through three. And this will prevent the medial side of our foot from touching the ground. Our lateral longitudinal arch is not going to be as high as the medial arch and will extend between our little toe and our heel. And the bones that form this will be the calcaneus, cuboid, and metatarsals 4 and 5. Our transverse arch is going to run perpendicular to the longitudinal arches. So this is essentially our um, foot that has been cut in a coronal plane. Sorry about that. And we can see our tarsal bones over here. This helps us see the transverse arch in here. It's going to be formed by the distal row of tarsals and the basis of all of our metatarsals. And when we look at our footprint, it's going to illustrate the position of our longitudinal arches. We can see that we don't have the full footprint in here because of that medial longitudinal arch being so high. And then we see here is the location of our lateral longitudinal arch that isn't quite so high. Now for some clinical views on pathologies of the foot. Some people suffer from what's known as a bunion. This is when we have a localized swelling at the first metatarsophalangeal joint. So notice here's our metatarsal and here's our proximal phalanx. This causes our toe to point toward the second toe or laterally. Then we have pes planus. This is a condition known as flat feet, where we see that that medial longitudinal arch is flattened. And this is caused by excess weight, posture abnormalities, or weak supporting tissues. And our pes cavus is going to be when we have an extensively high longitudinal arch, which is pictured over here. Next we have Talipes equinovaris, and this is a congenital club foot. This is going to occur when we don't have enough room in the womb, and the feet are prematurely inverted. We'll also see that the ankles are plantar flexed. In a metatarsal stress fracture, we are going to have this occur due to repetitive pressure, and this typically takes place in runners that have more pronation going on with their foot.